Hi. Very nice to be here again with you, and let me thank to Planet Youth for welcoming us again and giving us the opportunity to be here again sharing this world gathering. Um, yeah, my name is Pedro, I'm a journalist, and I'll be moderating this next talk on um, transatlantic synergies. So let me introduce to you our uh, guests, well, actually two of our three guests, because uh, Antonio um, uh, Martins da Costa will be joining us uh, meanwhile. He's not here right now, but he'll join us meanwhile. Um, but David Simmers is, uh, I think, already with us online. So, David, I suppose you can hear me. David is, hi. Hi, how are you? Hey. I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me and, and um, asking me to join this panel. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, great. We'll do that just in a minute. Thank you very much, David. Very nice to meet you. And let me also uh, invite to join us, Manuela Pintado. She's a professor at uh, Univ uh, Catholic University uh, and leads the Center for Biotechnology and Fine Chemistry. Um, Manuela, let me start with you. If you could share with us the way that you have and are implementing a transatlantic synergy, because you're working uh, specifically uh, with uh, American uh, companies and in the university. Can you share with us yeah. your experience, please? Yeah, thank you, first of all. And, um, well, uh, in, in this case, in 2016, in fact, Catholic University is uh, always aiming to collaborate, to connect. I think especially in research is something, is our DNA. Um, and there was a moment where Catholic University organized a roadshow to the United States. And um, as a researcher, I was representing biotechnology in the roadshow. So uh, I tried to start establishing contacts to, to, to visit and to see if you could do some collaborations during that moment. So the first one of the contacts I did at that moment was diaspora in Portugal. In fact, uh, Jorge Portugal at that moment um, had several contacts in the United States, and one of the contacts was Hermiris Biotech Company. Um, during this roadshow, we, we, we visited Hermiris, and John Mell, as Portuguese, um, uh, uh, received us, and we were interacting about what we are doing here, what we have. So there was, in fact, an opportunity um, discussing and talking about what we were quite advanced in Portugal at that moment. We did um, a lot of uh, collaborations with Portuguese companies in circular economy, sustainability. So we were just telling our story about what we were doing. And there was a match. The match that Amaris was, in fact, a very sustainable company producing molecules by fermentation, but they were not yet looking for all the waste streams they had. So there was the match looking about the opportunity to collaborate. Now, remember that John at that moment said, OK, I'm really interested to collaborate, so let's, uh, uh, let's start um, uh, discussing what we can do. But uh, at the same time, I cannot forget that. It's really important. We had at that moment, ICEP was also interacting with John Mello, also trying to bring him to establish some business in Portugal. So, and all this, this strategy of Emery's in terms of circular economy, um, the knowledge we had in Portugal, and sometimes as Portuguese, I, I need to tell everyone that we need to show what we are doing, because in fact, we have a great advances in several areas in Portugal, and I think we need to also show them. And that moment where I show the, the areas and what we, we had achieved at, until that moment was the moment where, in fact, uh, Crossing um, this this uh, this old world, John starts a company in Portugal, Emery's Portugal, and we start a big project uh, funded by ICEP. This project, in fact, engage at the moment uh, we start with 70 researchers, and now we have 85 researchers. Uh, part of them from UCP, Catholic University, part of them from Emerys, and we are all together in the same building and working together and creating new ingredients from waste streams. 
And I can say now that in this field of circular economy, we are the innovation area of Emirates in Portugal. And from there, this connection, this bridge we have been creating, and each day we are getting closer and closer, brought, Portugal, brought Emirates to other business in Portugal. At the moment, they are also integrating here all the digitalization area. They are integrating all the logistics. And so this means that when we create transatlantic bridges, in fact, we are doing amazing things. So we need to trust what we have in Portugal. We need to show what we have. And I think it's a great opportunity to create uh, these uh, uh, bridges, and especially because we have been working a lot in sustainability. And I think we need to show and make this also uh, uh, an opportunity, opportunity for Portugal and other countries that want to join us. Hmm. Thank you. David, back to you. Um, you are the CEO of the Obama Foundation, and you want to um, inspire people to, to act. How do you look at the transatlantic synergies, how to uh, improve them, how to boost them, what to do, and how do you see that? Pedro, thank you. First of all, um, when we think, when President Obama asks us to think about leadership and what we can do as an organization over the course of the next few decades, um, we're not looking for leaders in any specific sector. Uh, we're looking for people from business, from the not-for-profit sector, civil society, and from government. Those three, and you can define them in different ways, are the legs of the stool in any community, in any region, in any country, and in any place like Europe, and you can talk about the transatlantic region in that way. Um, and so we are issue and sector agnostic, but we are very values specific, and this is where the transatlantic relationship becomes very, very important. Um, there is a deep foundation, certainly, uh, since the Second World War, of a liberal Western, Demo uh, a Western liberal democratic view that is based and begins with uh, classic liberalism and the understanding of freedom, um, of speech, of expression, of free markets, and the ability for people to interact with each other because that will optimize the well-being of humanity. And so when we think about the types of leaders that we're looking for in Europe, in the United States, um, the transatlantic connection begins with that foundation of values and in some ways a shared experience and a shared history uh, that's very, very important. It's that understanding of values, it's that understanding of the way we view society the way we view um, cultures, um, not with in any assessment that one is right and one is wrong, but certainly like with any interaction with another human being, you begin with the similarities. You begin with what do we have in common? And so when you think about the transatlantic relationship, I think that's the first thing that from our perspective is very, very important and a good starting point. The second thing, and let me just speak about Portugal specifically, besides the fact that my parents are both Portuguese um, born, my dad from São Miguel in the Azores and my mom from Baixo Alentejo. I was just there a couple of weeks ago and um, I just have to say to the Portuguese who are watching, and I agree with the previous speaker, um, you have so much going for you. Uh, you have so much innovation the young people that I met with and saw, the future and emerging leaders that we're focused on, are um, exceptional. They're extraordinary. The education system um, is generating um, engineers and scientists and, and entrepreneurs and innovators that are world class. And so that isn't just a Portuguese specific phenomenon. But it's something that I think when you think about um, the transatlantic world, I think is very important. So a unity of values, the second piece in terms of the talent pool that flows from that unity of values. And then the final thing that I will say um, to your question is um, we have seen over the past five years, both in the United States and globally, 
a tremendous amount of uncertainty and instability. Um, and whether or not that becomes the standard for the next five to 10 years to 20 years is unknowable. Um, but coming back to leadership and understanding that we're looking for young men and young women who have those values, who have that innovative spirit, but are also anchored around the basics of rule of law, around notions of stability, around the idea of reciprocity and community that gets us out of tribalism, that moves us away from autocracy and into the benefits of democracy um, is crucially important. And again, the transatlantic region provides this bridge um, in a way that can be an anchor, not just for the region itself, but globally in a way that I think is quite promising. Hmm. You've been a CEO for the Obama Foundation, I think, for six years almost. Uh, so these questions are not new for you. Uh, but when you say Western liberal democ democratic values, do you feel that that right now they are in under more threats than they were before? And should we um, do we have the need to uh, insist on them in, even more than than before? I think that um, every, well, let me back up. Um, the only constant is change. Um, the, the view that you can predict the future or that things will be as they were in the past, that's not a rational way to, to go through life. And so I think part of the tension that you're seeing right now that is a stressor on liberal democracies is a function both of information and the atomization of societies that flow from the consumption of information, where 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, where you had certain mediums in television, radio, and in newspapers that essentially presented a fairly constrained view of the world and acted as a gatekeeper for good and bad of what the discourse was, it essentially allowed for a container um, that at least in that um, view, liberal democracy focused on the centrality of the individual was still enveloped around a view of society and culture where people have things in common with one another. Um, liberty and union. Um, you. you liberal democracy expressed in its um, logical endgame around the individual without some kind of uh, coherence, without some kind of social cohesion um, becomes problematic. I think with the new mode of communication with the internet, with the web, uh, with social media, the cohesion between and among individuals begins to fray. And I think at that notion, uh, in that way, the, the, the inclination of people to kind of tend towards those who agree with them, who look like them, who worship like they do, who come from the same region, who come, the othering becomes much more pronounced. Um, so that's a problem to liberal democracy, because once we begin to tribalize, once we begin to other, then we quickly begin to see someone who is different, perhaps as an enemy and certainly as an opponent, uh, and as someone we really don't have any cohesion with. Um, now, there may be a paradox built in there, but essentially, I need to see the essence and the dignity and the worth of an individual who isn't like me outside of the group. And so, yes, I believe that going back to the, the basic fundamental notion of liberal democracy, as we have understood it, beginning with the individual, being more than the country that you're from, the region that you're from, the religion that you have, your race, your gender, or anything else becomes very, very important. And so there are these paradoxical tensions at play um, 
that I think uh, results uh, will require a couple of things. One is a reimagining of institutions. Um, the ones that have served us so well over the course, certainly in the post-World War II era, are fraying and perhaps aren't as well suited uh, to this environment. That's the first thing. The second thing that I think requires um, is um, an over-indexing, uh, a, 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 a focused attention to the instances where we begin to tribalize, when we begin to other and to find ways via our leaders to find common ground first um, as the only way to really sustain um, notions of liberal democracy in this new era. But it's a, um, it's a real test, uh, not just for the transatlantic region, but for, yeah. for the world. Yeah, Manuela, how does the, the academy look at, at these pressures? Uh, because, it, well, science itself is, uh, is being under yeah. pressure, uh, being questioned uh, not for, specific, for scientific reasons in, in, in uh, many times, but the academy itself as a, as a role, as an institution, as, um, uh, as forming, creating leaders for the future. How yeah. do you see this? Okay. Well, well, I, I think in, in this, we have academy, we have academy, we have the responsibility to train people, to, 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 to increase the knowledge of our, our, our students, to, to prepare them for the challenges of their life, um, providing the skills. And, and we, have, we have, have been facing, um, at the moment, a, a challenging, because the world is changing, and we need to adapt continuously our, our uh, academic system to prepare um, uh, with the new concepts uh, that are changing. We cannot have the classical uh, teaching. We cannot have the, 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 we need to continuously improve and bring the knowledge to our, especially in our areas of biotechnology, to create uh, the talent that we want to, to put in the market and, and, and especially to prepare them for the challenges that will have been all the climate changes, all the, 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 the the pollution, all, the, all the, the, the challenges that the, the world is, is facing. Um, in terms of, of this academic, I, I think we have, there is a global opportunity. At the moment, I remember when I started studying, we just have the university in Portugal, we are close here. Now, acad academy, uh, the university is, 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 is completely open to the world. I don't think we have a student that is not traveling during their, their, their studies to some other universities. And I think this, this global world, I think, is bringing also these bridges, they are so close now. So we don't have, in some cases, bridges because they are connected to the world. And, and this is really incredible because I would say that when we, our pattern of uh, a profession, a, a job, was to finish our studies, I remember, and to have a, 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 a job for a, a life. Now, we have a student that finished, is traveling for several countries, training during uh, their, their courses in a different culture, and then they finish and they stay there and change the world and then come back. So I think now we have the, the, the training world, the, 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 uh, at the moment is changing completely because the world is open. So I, I think sometimes, can you, do you have any, 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 are you blocked to travel? Are you blocked to create bridges? No, students now are really completely open. And so even sometimes at the moment we have all these grants to travel and, but the students are already so open to the world that in fact they, ju they just they don't need any more to be stimulated. They are already open to the world and, and this I think it's changing completely. Concerning the science, I would say that probably you were on the first areas where there is no bridges because we are interacting all over the world. Mm -hmm. We, 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 we have a scientist in Portugal that can be at the same level to the United States because we have the same standards, we have the same challenges. And when we ask for uh, uh, how, is the, how is the reputation of this, of this uh, researcher, 
In fact, we have the same students in the world, so to be in Portugal and the United States is the same. The problem sometimes for future you are talking is the resources, okay? And I think sometimes when we are looking for to, to, to have the same level of quality of research in Portugal or United States or other countries, the challenge is the resources we have. Because sometimes it's not the same to, to work in Portugal or uh, in, in, in Germany or, or in United States or, I don't know, in, in Nigeria. Because the resources are completely, completely different. Talent is everywhere, but sometimes you have this gap. So I would say that the, the future is challenging and we need to be creative. We need to establish bridges in order to get access to these resources, in order to have the same level that the others, because sometimes in each country uh, we don't have the same opportunities. And I think is what we are looking now, is to use these transnational connections to get access and to uh, to bring to Portugal also this funding, this investment capacity, and make our talent to be, um, to be uh, producing the same quality everywhere, um, but also through Portugal. And I think is what we have been missing for a long time, and I remember the first time I was in the United States, in fact, was looking for these opportunities that, in fact, mm -hmm. we could get it, and now we, we have this, this very strong collaboration. Um, just to remember about one thing that John Mello said that night, I would like also that Portugal could be a door, could be a door in future to Europe, to Africa. So, in fact, we have a culture in Portugal. We, have, we are a country, uh, besides our our peace, uh, the, 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 the beauty of our country, we have a good relationship with the most of the countries. And this is very important. We can be a route to establish connections to other countries. And I think it's also this uh, cultural um, uh, um, quality, this cultural uh, openness we have in Portugal, in fact, is, is also a very important opportunity to connect the world. Mm. And uh, that's, I think, I see Portugal in future is also to, we, so many centuries ago, we, are, we were all over the world. And I believe now, with our talent, with our capacity, with this beautiful country, we can establish connections through all over the world. It's my perspective for future. Mm. David, I, I could see you were nodding. So you agree that Portugal can be a door to, to Europe and Africa uh, for American investment, is that so? I do. There's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a sensibility that, that I noticed in Portugal. But, you know, look, I, I grew up in, and I'm where I am right now in a place called Taunton, Massachusetts. Um, it's the middle of the Portuguese diaspora here in southeastern New England. And there's an adaptability. Uh, that I have seen from this immigrant community, but still an anchor back to Portuguese culture. In at least the expression of Portuguese culture that I always saw growing up here in the United States was an openness, was uh, an adaptability. It was a movement between and among different communities. Um, and then there were Cape Verdeans, there were Brazilians, uh, there are individuals from Mozambique in Angola, from Guinea-Bissau. Um, and so Portugal as a gateway or as a door, I think goes to, you know, how do these things develop? Culture is the accumulation of decades and centuries of shared behaviors in a way to view things that's in common among a group of people. And when you look at the diaspora all over the planet, there is that sense of exploration, there is that sense of adaptability, there is that sense of meeting people where they are, understanding that you can't bring preconceived notions that are so rigid of the way things must be. You have to be, you have to be open that this is this goes to the, to the heart of exploration. This goes to the heart of travel. This goes to the heart of innovation. It goes to the heart of science. In entrepreneurship, it's 
the more we are clouded by ideology, by preconceived notion, by rigid assumptions, by biases, it's almost as if you have glasses on and you're just putting a different filter on. It requires first that you see with as much clarity as you possibly can the way things are. And then based upon that, you then make decisions that are pragmatic, that are rooted in the values that you have. You can't be unmoored. Um, but, but from what I've seen, that to me has been part of the Portuguese culture. And so for that reason, Pedro, I do agree that there's a tremendous opportunity, not just with Europe, but with Africa um, and with South America. When you think about mm -hmm. um, Brazil essentially being half of the population of South America, um, the opportunity that Portugal has is pretty extraordinary. Hmm. Let me finish uh, asking both of you uh, to, well, to address these people that are here listening to you, and many of them, I suppose, have a lot of aspirations. Um, and we've talked about the threats, the challenges, even some opportunities that we all have uh, uh, working with, uh, with each other to, to transform the world to a better future. How can both of you um, inspire uh, these people that are listening to you in order to believe and make part of, the, of, uh, of, of action? Uh, Manuela, starting with you, please. <laughs> well, <laughs> We had a session that we said, follow your heart. <laughs> and I think what I was doing all the time was following my heart. Because I believe that collaboration, connection is in fact uh, what our role in the world. No? Uh, and and uh, um, I have, during my life of research, I had several projects with Africa, with uh, Latin America, with, uh, with, with, uh, with Asia with Europe, and, and, and it's amazing when we know people from different cultures, we sit down, we discuss, and we see how can we be so complementary? How can we be so, uh, when we join our efforts, how we can in, in, enlarge our capacity? And, and I think is how I see, we cannot just stay in our, in our comfort space. We need to uh, challenge ourselves and to meet new people, meet new uh, cultures. And we see that suddenly we see so many opportunities because people are incredible everywhere, have a, a huge potential in terms of science, business, and we need this just to open to the world and just let us, let this, this interaction to, to make uh, amazing things. Mm. And I think is what I did all my life. And I was inspiring uh, a, a, a big research team. And I have been trying to inspire companies because in fact, if you trust that um, a connection, collaboration, uh, especially always trust each other because this is really, really important. Trust, I believe that um, you'll see that we always uh, achieve um, a better a, a better world for ourselves and and to to surrounding us. So it's really is, what I have been doing, and I believe that uh, connection is is the best for. And all. benefiting from from the diaspora that you mentioned previously. Yeah, yeah. I, I think when diaspora in Portugal was created, I think 2008 around it, this mm -hmm. group of diaspora, the ambassadors of Portugal. I think they are really, because we, we have a lot of very, very powerful people in, in, in the world. And sometimes we forget that they are there and they are also open to help us. And at that moment, I, this, this diaspora brought opportunities to, um, to establish connections with uh, different locations in the world, with different business, with different, even programs, so, social programs, very, very important to Portugal. And I think we need to enlarge this type of programs because, in fact, um, sometimes these people are also um, waiting for a, a moment to, to help their own country. And, and I think this, when I, I met people from diaspora, I believe that is a, a, 
a good experience that Portugal creates and that could be expanded in the coming years because uh, uh, we, can, we can bring amazing people to Portugal. Some of them were investing in Portugal, but sometimes also bringing their experience. <laughs> I think you lost your mic. <laughs> the, the... Okay. Maybe you can ask. <laughs> oh. Okay, don't worry. Okay, thanks. Um, so when diaspora bring also their experience from other countries and all the opportunities they learn and they are living in other countries, I think, in fact, has been creating a great momentum in Portugal through this diaspora. So I think uh, uh, it's uh, inspiring to continue this diaspora in the world. Thank you, David. On to you. <laughs> How do you inspire us to transform the world? I, <clears throat> I, one of my favorite things that President Obama uh, says to young people especially, but this applies to the rest of us who are more young at heart. Um, if you had to pick one time uh, in all of human history to be born, uh, without knowing where or to whom, you would pick now. You would pick right now. And so sometimes there is this pessimism that, uh, that overwhelms people. But when you think about the world right now compared to 50 years ago, to 100 years ago, to 200 years ago, <laughs> to 500 years ago, you would want to be born now. My daughters have all of the world's information, the accumulated knowledge of humanity in their hands. Almost all human beings have this in their hands in a way that has never happened before. Science, technology, collaboration, connection. This is unprecedented and it creates opportunities that previous generations have never had. My father, when he was born in São Miguel in 1939, no phone, no television, no radio, no bathroom, maybe a newspaper that would come once a week from the city nearby. And as he would say, you would, bo you would be born, you would live, and you would die in that village without seeing the world. For most of humanity, and certainly for Portugal and the United States, this isn't the case anymore. So that gives you a sense of the possibility and the opportunity. There are problems, of course. Some problems created by all of the advancement in technology that we have, and we briefly alluded to them. But so if you are young and you want to be hopeful, your ability to make the world a little bit better uh, which is a responsibility that all of us have. Not necessarily to transform. The capacity of one person to transform the planet is limited. The capacity of each person to make what they touch and who they interact with a little bit better, given the opportunities that they have, the networks they have, the experience they have, and the knowledge they have, has never been greater. I have an old boss who was the governor of Massachusetts who would say to us, hope for the best, but work for it. And so with inspiration, there is work. And the work requires discipline and ethics. Because without those two things, usually your capacity or opportunity to make things a little bit better is squandered. The discipline of understanding what you're very good at, what your opportunities are. The discipline of understanding essentially the reality of the circumstances that you face. The discipline of understanding that all of your actions have consequences and thinking about them beforehand. These are all parts of the things that once you have the inspiration, then you shift to what comes next. And let me just close with ethics or virtue. Um, because it gets missed in a lot of discussions. In a world as small as it is right now, a notion of reciprocity, a notion of the responsibility that you and I have to each other as we interact has never, ever been greater. 
And so you need to begin with that idea that essentially when I act, am I acting in a way that is beneficial, not just to myself, but to others? When I act, am I doing it in a way that is predicated on generosity of spirit rather than greed, that is predicated on goodwill rather than anger, in a way that is predicated on a notion that I can't know everything and I need to be open to wisdom and not clouded by the ignorance of thinking that I know the only way. And so when I marry the opportunity that we all have with the discipline and the ethics that come, you know, for everybody who is listening or watching in our at attendance, um, the possibilities that people have have never ever been so great as they are right now. So to close, like my old boss said, hope for the best and work for it. Hope for the best and work for it. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Manuela. And thank you.